Okay. Welcome to Global Kinship, Exploring the Emerging Noosphere. My name is Gail Ransom, and I'm one of a team of three who coordinate this monthly webinar. My cohorts are Penny Andrews and Bob Eisenberger. And of course, today we have and are pleased to welcome Dr. Peter Victor. Uh, coming up on January, we wanted to give you a heads up that we won't be meeting the first a first Thursday in January because, you know, it's just too close to festivities. Some people forget. And so we're going to on January 11th, where we'll welcome Stephanie Rierich, who is with the Mutual Aid Network. And then on February 2nd, Dwayne Elgin, who wrote Choosing Life, Choosing Earth, and uh, made a film with it. It will be with us there on uh, February 2nd. I think all of us are still trying to grasp the, and understand the concept or the experience of the noosphere. <clears throat> of course, it started very early, very early on in, in human history, about the first time somebody made uh, had a aha moment that that consciousness began. But um, it reminds me of a story that uh, Brian Swim told us about the elephants. When a matriarch in an elephant tribe dies, the elephants come from 500 miles to mourn her. Wow. Now, how did they know? <laughs> how did they know that? Because they don't have texts. You know, they, they just knew it, right? It goes through that space that we're calling the newosphere, that space in between us that, that um, <laughs> we shape together. I think also about middle school girls who uh, come to school all wearing the same outfit. You know how that goes. Or um, you meet somebody coming around the corner you were just thinking about. Those kind of experiences are one way we can kind of grasp a bit how mysterious and yet powerful and strong and present this noosphere is. So now we're in the middle of COP28 and um, with great hopes of uh, something happening with those people there in their uh, cos cosmology, their, their consciousness talking to each other. And so uh, we'll see what Dr. Victor says and um, just want to welcome you all. Glad to have you here. I'd love it, to open. Is it with over the reading? reading? Oh, oh, um, and and first, before I start, just to tag on to what Gail was saying about COP, um, I was listening to a journalist describe where we are today. And he said, we're stuck in the frozenness of the status quo hmm. and incarcerated in old patterns. And, and, you know, most of us know well and deeply that we cannot continue. So to that end, I offer this poetry reading from Rosemary Tromer called Never the Same. So take a minute just to relax into our time together and I'll begin. Sometimes a person wakes believing they are a storm. It's hard to deny it, what with all the rain pouring out of the gutters of the mind, all the gusts blowing through, all the squalls, all the gray. But by afternoon, it seems obvious they are a garden about to sprout. By night, it is clear they are a moon, luminous, radiant, faithful. That's the danger, I suppose, of believing any frame. Let me believe then in curiosity, in wonder, in change. Let me trust how essential it is to stumble into the trough of the unknown. Marvel how trough becomes wings, becomes faith, becomes math. Let me trust uncertainty is a sacred path. Thank you, Penny. Uh, oh, <laughs> my apologies. There we go. Um, ah, 
Let me offer uh, my own now welcome and greetings to everyone this afternoon. First, a uh, couple of technical notes. Uh, most of us are accustomed to this, but in case we uh, have some newcomers, of course, we ask that you remain muted at your end um, until we get to the Q&A point, at which um, when I spotlight you, um, you can, of course, unmute yourself to ask your question. And um, uh, speaking of which, um, at that point, when you have a question, I ask that you go to your Zoom toolbar, click on the Reactions button, and you'll see the words raise hand and that'll put you in a lineup at the top of the queue and we can um, uh, take everyone in sequence. Thanks very much. Every day it seems the headlines scream at us. The cost of living is skyrocketing. Not that we need the headlines to tell us. Who among us has not felt the sting at the grocery store or the gas pump? And invariably, when discussing the possible projects or technology to adapt or mitigate to the current and forthcoming ecological disasters, my eyes and perhaps yours begin to glaze over, given the numbers which try to convey the size and costs of doing so. We live within a particular economic paradigm, which more and more people are recognizing must, must change. But how to affect that change? Like the goldfish in its bowl, we find it difficult to know that we are within one particular system, one of many possibilities. So it can seem to us impossible to imagine a different form of economics. This issue is coming increasingly to the forefront. Just last week in his speech for the opening of COP28, King Charles said, unless we rapidly repair and restore nature's unique economy based on harmony and balance, which is our ultimate sustainer, our own economy and survivability will be imperiled. Our guest today is well positioned to help us understand why we find ourselves in this system and how we might move forward in a sustainable and humane way. Dr. Peter Victor, author of Escape from Overshoot, Economics for a Planet in Peril, 2023, Herman Daly's Economics for a Full World, His Life and Ideas, 2022, and Managing Without Growth, Slower by Design, Not Disaster, published in 2008 and again in 2019. Peter is Professor Emeritus and Senior Scholar at York University, Toronto, Canada. He has worked for over 50 years in Canada and abroad on economy and environment issues as an academic, consultant, and public servant. His work on ecological economics has been recognized through the award of the Molson Prize in the Social Sciences by the Canada Council for the Arts in 2011 the Bolding Memorial Prize from the International Society for Ecological Economics in 2014, and his election to the Royal Society of Canada in 2015. Currently, Peter is a member of the Honorary Board of the David Suzuki Foundation and Chair of the Science Advisory Committee of the Footprint Data Foundation, and has served on many advisory boards in the public and private sectors. Peter, I bid you good welcome and um, turn the spotlight over to you. Well, thank you very much, Bob, for that uh, introduction. And uh, it, and also I want to thank the comments from uh, Penny and Gail uh, to begin this event. Um, I'm going to share my screen now, I hope. Um, it's always a tense moment. <laughs> um, um, so as Bob suggested, I'm going to talk to you about um, my latest book, Escape from Overshoot Economics for a Planet in Peril. Um, I hope that the inclusion of the word economics 
uh, isn't something that you're disturbed by or uh, annoyed by or uh, frightened by, um, I, I'll try to talk in as non-technical a way as I can, but I do want to um, convey some key ideas about economics and maybe different kind of economics than, than you're used to reading about uh, in the media or hearing about that way. Um, so we have a big menu, a long menu. I've got to tell you what I mean by Earth Overshoot and give you a quick look at some of the evidence for that. Uh, the, these concerns are not new, so I'll go back into the history of economics and give, uh, tell you about some warnings. Uh, go back a long, long way about uh, economic growth and, and its consequences. Then I want to say something about current trends to an uncertain future. I was glad uncertainty was mentioned in the introductory remarks. Um, you can't just project current trends into the future to say what the future will be like, but it is a place to start. Uh, I need to say something about green growth, which is a term that's banded about as if it's the solution to all our problems. And I don't think it is. Uh, we do have to change course. So I'll have something to say about a number of the ideas for doing that. Uh, modeling an escape from overshoot refers to the research that I've been doing for the last 15, 20 years using uh, computers to try to um, model uh, the transition of the Canadian economy into something rather different and one that's not dependent on growth, but is much gentler on the environment. Then um, I'm going to offer you 14 propositions for an escape from overshoot, not so much a plan, but propositions that if we agree with them, and if you agree with them, then they give us the foundation for moving forward. And finally, um, I'll show actually some photographs that uh, indicate what a brighter future might look like, particularly in, in a high income countries like Canada and the US. Well, this is a picture of our home. I'm sure everybody sees this, seen this many, many times. Uh, this came out in the 1960s when I was doing my PhD research on economics and it influenced me greatly because I had to think about, well, where does the economy fit in in that sphere? Um, because the way economics was being taught then and, and is largely still being taught now was um, just neglecting that relationship, just uh, suggesting that the economy was something you could talk about as if it didn't depend upon its relationship with, uh, with Mother Earth. Uh, so that's been a fundamental feature of my work on what's called ecological economics ever since. So um, getting to the book specifically, um, the reason I'm showing you this is not just to impress upon you the importance of, of maybe spending a little bit of time with the book, but you'll see in the center of this word overshoot is a, is a graphic. The designer of this uh, cover didn't speak to me about this. She just picked that off the internet for a, uh, a, a in relation to what overshoot meant because she didn't know that. Well, I'll show you where that comes from. It comes from this very important graphic here. Now, this shows data from 1961 uh, up to about 2019, 2018, 2019, uh, for the globe, for, for the globe taken as a whole. We also produce the same sort of graph for all the countries in the world. But looking at the global picture, the um, top line shows what we call the ecological footprint, which is the demand on average a human being on planet Earth places on the planet to supply us with the materials, energy, uh, um, what we call biocapacity, all the things that grow uh, are, are used by us in the way we, we live. So that's an average for the whole, for the whole globe. The other um, line shows the biocapacity of the planet. Both of these on a per capita, per person basis. And what you can see is that up until uh, about 1970, the humanity's um, ecological footprint was less than an estimate of the biocapacity, the capacity of the planet to support us. Uh, but when uh, these lines crossed, as they did in about 1970, uh, the per capita average footprint of humans on planet Earth began to exceed, ultimately quite significantly, the declining biocapacity per person. We overshot the capacity of the planet to support us. Now that's on a per capita basis. We can also show it on a total basis. What I've done here is to, is to take the components of the ecological footprint, the amount of 
carbon that the atmosphere absorbs and the excess where it, where where it fails to absorb and it accumulates in the in the atmosphere and is causing climate change our use of the biosphere for forest products grazing land cropland built up land and for fishing grounds and you can see again in around 1970 the total ecological footprint this is now the total not just per capita the total ecological footprint of of humans on planet earth at that time was just about equal to the bio capacity the capacity of the planet to support that but after 2000 uh, sorry after 1970 this is what happened every component of the ecological footprint increased but of course we've got this major concern about the excess use of the atmosphere for using for for accommodating our greenhouse gases so there are many ways of showing this kind of story. I'll only show it in one other way, which has become uh, very influential. I'm very glad to say it's this idea of identifying uh, about nine, I think there are nine issues of planetary significance here. Climate change is there. Uh, biosphere integrity refers to the what these authors call, would call uh, the sustenance of our capacity. Land system change, fresh water use, uh, phosphorus and nitrogen, excesses in the in the in the environment and so on um and the folks who came up with this identified for each of these issues uh, the what they call a safe operating space for humanity if we stay within the this the this area here we can do that on and on indefinitely but you can see when they came up with this in 2009 we were already exceeding um the extent to which the biosphere was being used for supporting our, our biological requirements. We were exceeding it for climate change and for disposal of nitrogen. This is largely through farming. They did it again in 2015, and now we've crossed another boundary. And now this year, again, they've done it for 2023, and we've now crossed, uh, I think, six of the boundaries, yes. So you can see the data is all pointing in the same direction. We are in an era of overshoot. I've got to say something more about climate change, but I'm going to add a feature which perhaps is not that well known to you. This is a famous curve we see all the time, the Keeling curve, showing the average concentration of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere rising over time. You can see all these international conferences. <laughs> They're very important, but they didn't haven't done anything to slow down the rise in this curve, and it's continued on after 2018. Uh, but what I want to add to that is what's happening in the oceans, because the um, oceans also absorb greenhouse gases that humans uh, produce mostly from the combustion of fossil fuels, and they're accumulating in the oceans, making it more and more acidic. Uh, that's not good. It's not good for what lives there, and it's not good for species like us, which depend on the health of the oceans in many ways. To uh, further... Um, depress us, I'm afraid. This isn't good news to begin with, but it gets a bit better as I proceed. We have here the Global Living Planet Index, again from 1970 to almost the present. It's hard to get the data completely up to date, but it's it's uh, still fairly current. Um, this shows the average abundance of over 20,000 populations representing over 4,000 species of mammals, birds, reptiles, and amphibians, and so on. So if we say that this index had a value of one in 1970, this is what's happened to it. We've lost 69% of these populations, probably gone up from that um, since uh, 2018, uh, over that period. That doesn't mean they've been completely wiped out, but on average, the species populations have declined dramatically. On land, one of the main... Um, issues is the how we as humans have transformed land use 10,000 years ago land on planet earth whoops sorry um where things grew was 57 percent forests and 42 percent wild grasslands and shrubs not a lot changed in the 5,000 years that followed that but come to 1700 when industrialization was beginning in britain other parts of europe uh, we see some cropland and grazing land appearing and what's happening there, the forests are being depleted and the wild grasslands and shrubs are getting smaller. Here's 1900. <coughs> Here's 19, uh, 2018. And you can see that forest land has been reduced significantly. So has wild grasslands and shrubs. And this means that other species with which we share the planet have been dramatically affected by our activities as, hum as humans. To illustrate that, this image shows 
for each square a million tons of the species represented. So in the middle, we have humans. So each square represents a million tons of human beings. Here we have cattle, sheep, pigs, goats. These are all animals that largely owe their survival or their existence, I should say, to the fact that humans eat them or we take um, uh, other products from them, such as leather from cattle. The one thing that's not shown here is wildlife. What about the wild mammals? Well, I'll, I'll show you what's missing. So humans and the animals that depend upon us because we use them represent now 96% of the weight of animals, mammals on planet Earth. 4% are wild. If this isn't evidence of overshoot, I don't know what is. And on a daily basis, I saw this very recently, this shows you on a daily basis, the number of different animals, cows, 900,000, 1.4 million goats that are consumed by humans. You can just read those numbers. They bring me a chill. I hope they also find, you find them disturbing. But it's not just mammals. Here's uh, what we've done to insects uh, in the last uh, decade. This is the decline in different kinds of insects. Um, over that period, and of course, insects are fed, uh, feed other animals, and so there's a chain of effect there that we have to be concerned with. So you can see, uh, there's, and this is just a sort of a, a very quick overview of, of some of the data. There's, there's, there's more in my book, and there's certainly much more on the internet. Let me move on to the warnings that we can even now see the relevance of going back to the founders of economics. Adam Smith, sorry, I think we're coughing too much. Yeah. Thomas Malthus, David Ricardo, three British economists. Industrial industrialization started in Britain, so economics also, as we know, it started there. They all three thought that growth would end badly in different, for different reasons. So much so that a historian of the time, a little bit later on, decided that economics was a dismal science and called it that. Now, I'm going to read out some quotes from some of these earlier economists. This is John Stuart Mill, a famous philosopher, also a famous economist. He was an early advocate of a steady state economy. He said that, um, excuse me, I, I, hold on a second. You must stop her I have an animal here, actually a couple in the house. I'm sorry if the dog was disturbing you. I think she'll be quiet now. Well, he says, I'm not charmed with the ideal of life held out by those who think that the normal state of human beings is that of struggling to get on, that the trampling, crushing, elbowing, and treading on each other's heels, which form the existing type of social life, are the most desirable lot of humankind, or anything but the disagreeable symptoms of one of the phases of industrial progress. Uh, Karl Marx, surprisingly enough, had a lot to say about the relationship between humans and nature. In particular, he was interested in how our approach to nature had been changed by the emergence of capitalism. And he said that nature becomes for the first time simply an object for mankind, purely a matter of utility. It ceases to be recognized as a power in its own right, and the theoretical knowledge of its independent laws appears only as a stratagem designed to subdue it to human requirements. And if it was true then, it's certainly true now. Now, Alfred Marshall, very different person from, Alf from uh, Karl Marx, and um, probably the most influential economist for the first uh, much of the first half of the 20th century, noted that a far-seeing statesman will feel a greater responsibility to future generations when legislating as to land than to other forms of wealth. And that from the economic and from the ethical point of view, land must everywhere and always be classed as a thing by itself. In other words, we can't just go around valuing everything in terms of dollars and thinking, well, you can just compare things in terms of the dollar price that they are, that they may fetch uh, on the market, uh, that we should make distinctions between, uh, he said land, I think today, if he was writing this, he'd probably say nature. Um, um, the, the putting a dollar value on nature is something that uh, is very suspect. In terms of new ideas, one of the first person to really come 
spleen on this and, and, and tell us how we should think about new ideas was Kenneth Boulding, who in 1966 66, wrote a wonderful essay in which he said the closed earth of the future. Now, he had seen the, the same photo I showed you at the beginning of planet Earth. The closed earth of the future um, requires economic principles which are somewhat different from those of the open past. The closed economy, by closed economy, he means an economy um, which contains all of its materials. So the earth is a closed uh, a closed system. It's open to energy, but not to materials. And and uh, he's, and that's how we should think about um, a modern economy, is what he's saying. The closed economy of the future might be called the spaceman economy, in which the earth has become a single spaceship without unlimited reservoirs of anything, either for extraction or for pollution, and in which therefore man, a bit old fashioned in that sense, must find his place in a cyclical ecological system. So he advised that our economics had to adjust to this um, situation that we were in fact traveling on spaceship Earth with all our materials on board uh, and everything that we needed was there, but it has to be uh, used very carefully. Somebody else who developed these ideas, particularly on the energy side, was Nicholas Georgescu Rogan. He pointed out that all physical processes, natural and technological, proceed in such a way that the availability of the energy involved decreases. And this applies to us as human beings. It applies to any living being that we take in food for energy the energy doesn't disappear, it just gets degraded and that we have to keep going back for a further input of energy. And the same principle applies to our economy. Simon Kuznets, a very famous American economist who did the very important early work on gross domestic product, which I'm sure many of you have heard about um, because it's so often mentioned in the media. Now, this is what he said. He used the term national income, but it's essentially the same as gross domestic product. He said the welfare of a nation can scarcely be inferred from a measurement of national income. Goals for more growth should specify of what and for what. Up to now, I've shown you uh, examples of what some famous economists have said. I'm going to finish with a politician, all obviously all known to you as uh, if, if, if every well, everyone knows Robert Kennedy, I think. Now he was, he said in the most eloquent way, and it's a long quote, but I do want to read it out to you. He said, "Our gross national product is again essentially the same as gross domestic product. If we should judge America by that, counts air pollution and cigarette advertising and ambulances to clear our highways of carnage. It counts the destruction of our redwoods and the loss of our natural wonder in chaotic sprawl." It, can, it counts napalm and the cost of nuclear of a nuclear warhead and armored cars for police who fight riots in our streets. It counts the television programs which glorify violence in order to sell toys to our children. Yet the gross national product does not allow for the health of our children, the quality of their education or the joy of their play. It does not include the beauty of our poetry or the strength of our marriages, the intelligence of our public debate or the integrity of our public officials. It measures neither our wit nor our courage, neither our wisdom nor our learning, neither our compassion nor our devotion to our country. It measures everything in short, except that which makes life worthwhile. I think it's a, it's a wonderful quote. And yet, you and it makes you think, why did we then attach so much significance to this gross national product, gross domestic product, and worry about whether it's rising or falling when it contains all of these things that shouldn't be there and misses out many of the things that should be. It's not a, a reliable indicator of how well we are doing um, at all. So moving on, I want to talk about current trends to an uncertain future. As I prepared for my book, I came across this um, graphic called the future cone. And it's a way of thinking about how we all, when we think about the future, um, can relate to. Um, this, is, this is us now. Uh, and what the author of this, John Voros, um, postulated was that looking forward over time, there's a kind of cone, like a, um, a, a, a headlight on a car. Uh, and in the middle, he put 
what each of us might think is likely to happen. Now we can disagree on the, the, that, but the category is good. We can each think about what do we think is likely to happen if, with given, given current trends. Outside of that, he said, well, outside of that part of the cone is what could happen based on current knowledge. And there's what po what's possible, what future knowledge might uh, allow to happen. And then what each of us might consider preposterous, impossible, won't ever happen. And I make a lot of use of this cone in the book because it's in, an interesting way to compare different views of the future because different people, different economists from different schools of thought put different things in those in those categories. Um, and be, uh, what I'm going to do now is show you some current trends and each of you can think about what you think might be the future for each of these items, the current trend that I'm showing you. Yes. Oh, and finally, I, I forgot the last one. For each of us, we have a preferable future where we bring in our value judgments, what we want to happen, what we think ought to happen. And that could range across all of those categories I've just mentioned. So let's start with population, the world population. This is from 1950. So this is data up until about 2020. And from there, um, this is the, from the United Nations. They have their um, the solid red line showing their medium forecast. But they they make small changes to assumptions, and it gives them a spread of forecasts. Now, one of the changes that they experiment with is, well, if we start from this medium scenario, but we just vary the average number of children that women on planet Earth have, we make it a half more than is built into this scenario. Look what happens to the population. If on average women have, I know it's fine, it sounds funny, half a child more uh, than is assumed here, the population will shoot up. But if they have half a child less, the population peaks and declines. What strikes me about this is that the difference between these two numbers, the size of the population there, that is actually the same as what the total population is right now. So there's this tremendous widespread of what the population, the future population of the world could be obtained by varying assumptions that are in the forecast. Um, and it makes a huge difference, of course, to the impact that we will have on the planet as to which of these comes to pass. I want to say something about, and now this goes a long way back to 2 million years BC, just talk about the changes in the nature of the economy that um, have taken place over this period. And there are three um, transformations that distinguishing that, that distinguish um, uh, the time path of our economic history. So for the, most of our most of the human history we we have, um, the transformation of metal was the critical uh, technological factor shown over here. From about 1780 on, uh, up until 1970, it was all about transforming energy, water power, steam power, electric power, combustion power. And now we're in the era where it's the transformation of information that's really defining the era that we're in. And that's affecting com communication. Uh, and it's all about computing. And we're looking now at artificial intelligence. I'm sure we're all, all aware of that. So that's kind of a, an interesting backdrop to think about when we're looking to the future and what might be possible, plausible, and so on. I want to say something about the change in computing power. Uh, this is a photograph actually taken the year I was born, 1946. This was the first general purpose computer, ENIAC, which had um, 18,000 vacuum tubes, didn't have transistors, hadn't been invented then, and weighed 30,000 kilos. This was a big piece of equipment. And then compare that with the iPhone, the first one that came out in 2007, weighed 135 grams, uh, was incredibly powerful compared with ENIAC, and you could hold it in the palm of your hand. This is a graph which tells the story of how that happened. It was all about the um, increasing uh, number of transistors that could be put on a microprocessor and microprocessors are the heart and soul of uh, of uh, iPhones and, and all computers. 
this scale is not your normal arithmetic scale. It's what we call a logarithmic scale. So as you go up by each line, you in fact increase by 10. Uh, and you can see you got 100, 1,000, 10,000. When that iPhone was manufactured, uh, a microprocessor had about 100,000 transistors on it. Uh, now um, we're up to maybe 30 million. And it's because of this that the, the computers and all the electronics can do so much more than when no, just not that long ago. And looking at the at the faces of everybody on this call, many of you um, lived through have lived through this history as I have. I want to say something though about what happens when we make things more efficient, because that increase in transistors on a microprocessor has made our equipment way more efficient. We have something which is a, something has to be paid attention to. It's called the rebound effect, and the rebound effect can comes when you increase the efficiency of something, perhaps expecting it to reduce energy requirements, um, but can have the, the opposite effect. So um, the first person to comment on this was an economist in the uh, mid 19th century who talked about the early steam engine that, that James Watt um, uh, designed uh, in about 1760. I think I got that day. Anyway, late, late 18th century. And um, what would happen if it became more efficient? Uh, you might have thought then, well, then we'll just use less coal. In fact, quite the opposite. Because it became more efficient, many more were built and sold and, and used in factories, it changed the whole way industrialization continued, and the consumption of coal just skyrocketed. Well, here's an example of lighting. This is a wealthy drawing room in the late 19th century, and you can see there are some electric light here and there's daylight coming in but nonetheless the room is not particularly well lit and here you have a room in darkness natural darkness but it's lit by electric light and so we're using way more electricity for lighting now than in the late 19th century when it was first used so this is an example of the rebound effect the other aspect of, or not one other aspect of the rebound effect i want to highlight is that miniaturization has, has made some very big technology possible. Look at this. This is the world's largest earth mover. It's um, heavier than the Eiffel Tower and taller than the Statue of Liberty. It only requires three or four people to operate it. It can move over a quarter of a million tons of fuel. This is for di digging out fossil fuels uh, per day. This down here, if you can see it, is a very large bulldozer. It's tiny compared with this equipment. And the point I'm going to make is that it's miniaturization that has made this possible. So the idea that by making things smaller and more efficient will somehow solve the problem of the impact of humans on planet Earth, uh, really got to, you've really got to question that. Now, if we're digging out all this material from the Earth, much of it goes into the things we make. So we need big ships to carry this stuff. This, this ship carries over 21,000 containers. You've all seen these 20 foot containers one by one on the highway. This has 21,000 or more contain containers on it, carrying stuff to be, we say consumed, but to be used and ultimately thrown away by humans. Another uh, current trend is the rising inequality both among nations there's a greater spread and within nations. This is a, a quite a remarkable photograph, at least from my point of view, in Brazil showing how some people live and how a lot of people also live in, in the barrios there. Or look at this contrast between um, children fortunate enough to have access to a Mac, a Mac computer. And here you have children. Uh, the, the, this photo was taken in Afghanistan, uh, refugees. Um, if the, this little boy could see these kids, one can only guess what he would be thinking. Um, I'm not sure if this is the final trend I want to show you, but it's an important one. Uh, it's about economic growth. And this is economic growth from high income countries, countries like Canada and, and the US, uh, the European countries. Now, the growth rate, the economic growth, the rate of increase in gross domestic product, which is what we mean by economic growth, fluctuates a lot when we get big dips, when we have a recession. I've got one here, one here, and uh, the COVID crisis here. But there's a general trend of growth slowing down, despite all the efforts that governments are making to boost the rate of economic growth. 
there's this trend, and a lot's been written about this, why that's happening, um, the different the different uh, factors that are slowing growth. So even if we want, if we turn to economic growth as a solution to our problems, we got a problem there because the, the economies are slowing anyway. Let me say some words about green growth. The idea of green growth is that we can have economic growth, but we can green it, whatever that means, and reduce, well, it means reduce the impact of humanity and hum the human economy on the biosphere. This report, about 12 years old now, has a number of key findings. One of them is that a green economy grows faster than a brown economy, a con conventional economy, over time, while maintaining and restoring natural capital. I'd say, personally, I don't like the term natural capital. I prefer the term nature, but um, for various reasons, it's a term that's becoming increasingly widely used. The point here is this claim that not only can we make the economy work so that it reduces the impact on the environment, uh, it'll grow faster. I see that already as an example of uh, uh, the rebound effect, but that's another point. So I'm going to talk about um, climate just for a few minutes. And the my major point I want to make to you is that climate change is a problem caused by the stock of greenhouse gases that are cu accumulating in the atmosphere. It's not a flow problem. I mean, uh, and I use this a picture of a of a bathtub to show the distinction. This is the water flowing in. But what really matters to you when you're going to have a bath is is, is the stock of water that, that you want to accumulate. And then when when it's right, when it's just what you want, you turn off the flow and the stock stays there. Um, you've all I'm sure heard the term net zero. Where, where countries are committing to achieve net zero greenhouse gas emissions by a certain date. What they're saying is they want at some point this flow to be zero. What I want to make to you, though, is it's the stock that has to be brought under control. And just because you reach net zero at some year doesn't tell you what the stock is. What the stock is, is the accumulation of the flow up to that point. Let me let me show you an, uh, an, an example. This is a graph from 2022 to 2050. And um, I want you to understand that the Greenhouse gas emissions, it can be for the US, can be for Canada, can be for the city that you live in. This is a very <laughs> widely applicable graph. But it says that whatever it is, and we'll talk about it as a country, um, we want it to reach net zero by 2050. Well, all of these paths get to net zero by 2050. There's a, there's a linear reduction, just a straight line. There's a technological breakthrough, a small reduction here. And then a major reduction, and then down to net zero in 2050. Now, this is an annual reduction of almost 10% per year in emissions per unit of GDP. So that's that would be measured as um, kilograms or tons of emissions of greenhouse gases per, say, million dollars of gross domestic product. It's bringing that down year after year by 10%, that ratio will also get you to net zero by 2050. Now, I've also assumed that a certain percentage of these initial emissions are sequestered by some technology or maybe by planting more trees. And where it really matters with this scenario, the green one, uh, the rate of economic growth of 2% a year, which is about what the high-income countries uh, such as ours are, are witnessing right now. Now that's a, that's so. Those are three net zero scenarios. Let's see what happens to the accumulation of greenhouse gases over that period. I'm going to use the term carbon budget, and I'm going to say the budget is ten times the initial what we start off with initial, saying we've only got room in the atmosphere for ten times the annual emissions of 2022. That's our carbon budget. That's if you like. That's what we have to stay be beneath, or not exceed, in order not to exceed a one and a half degree increase in the average temperature of the planet, which is a, sort of the the most commonly used target now. Well, here is the accumulation accumulation of greenhouse gases, the stock, with those three scenarios. Look what happens with linear reduction. We shoot through the budget in about twenty thirty five. With a technological breakthrough, we shoot through the budget even earlier. But with this 
particular uh, uh, reduction of nearly 10% in emissions per dollar of GDP, we can just stay within the budget. And I've calculated it for that purpose. So I want to then put to you what, can, what, what has been the record? We don't know in the future whether that's feasible, but we can learn something from what's happened in the past to, to, to make a judgment of how feasible that is. So what I did, I went to uh, the data from the World Bank and said, well, which countries have had at least three years, three consecutive years, where they've reduced, there's a change in terminology, but it's CO2 emissions per dollar of GDP by 9.7% since 1990. How many of that have done it for three years? We need it for 28 years. But what about three years? Well, this is a list of all the countries have done it for at least at least three years. You can see that neither the US or Canada have done it for a single year. So when we're being told that green growth is a way forward, what people are saying to us is that we can find a way to reduce our the emissions of our economy by nearly 10% per dollar of GDP for 28 years in a row. We've not done it for one year in the last 20, 28 years. And of course, every year we, we don't do it, that percentage reduction in, in emissions intensity goes up. So I'm sorry, I don't think green growth is the answer. Now, if we had a slower rate of economic growth, that requirement for reduction in emissions per dollar reduces. The economy doesn't grow so fast, you don't have to reduce the emission per dollar so rapidly. And I don't have time to go further into that, but a lot of my work um, is related to that because I, I then wanted to say, well, could we manage without economic growth? Is it possible to have our kind of economy, our kind of life, our kind of society, and if not, what might it look like? Well, there are many people now, and I'm so pleased to be able to say this to you, who are making proposals for an alternative future than business as usual, striving for economic growth and, and hoping that technology will, will solve the problem. I can't go through all these in detail, but I can tell you a bit about them. There's the steady state economy, which I will say a bit more about. Um, which recognizes that we've got these biophysical limits. We have to have an economy that recognizes those. And one way is to just operate at a level that's within those limits. We have the circular economy, which is very much focused on minimizing resources that we use and waste because of recycling and better design. We have the regenerative economy. This has been led by John Fullerton, who's a, a, a US uh, ex-man from um, Wall Street. A uh, key part of his proposal is about reforming finance. We have the well-being economy, which says, "Look, let's let's be clear that what we want about what we want the economy for. We want it to promote our well-being and the well-being of nature." And so they've they've developed schemes for that. I'll say more about that in a moment. We can learn from the global south. They have a version of the well-being economy called Buen Vivir, which is all about living the good life. And in fact, there are a couple of countries that have put that right in their constitution. Then we have donut e economics, which I will say about more about in a moment. And then um, uh, more ambitious than that is this movement largely based in the in Europe, but it's now spreading into North America, calling for degrowth. They reject growth and they're building a movement. So it's more than just new ideas. It's also let's get people active to make change. And then there's a eco-socialism which says, look, the, the root cause of all this is capitalism. We've got to have a different system altogether. Okay, some words about Herman Daly. Now, I'm a great fan of Herman Daly. I've written his biography. I'll show you an image of that in a moment. Um, and I came to know him very well. Herman's a Texan, uh, born and bred, loves the South. Um, I also want to mention him because he's a religious man, or unfortunately he died in 2022. He was very religious. And unlike pretty well any other economist I've met or know about, he would talk about his religion. It affected his work as an economist. I, I thought that was, was worth telling you. Now, in 1973, he published a book called Toward a Steady State Economy. And what he did was he draw, he, he used a square. Later on, he, he turned this into a circle, but I wanted to show you his first image. 
representing planet Earth. Only thing entering it is the sun, and the only thing that leaves it is waste heat. All the materials in, in planet Earth that, are, that move around all the time stay on, on the planet. So here's the within the within planet Earth, we have the economy, which draws in primary matter and primary energy for so fossil fuels and minerals. Uh, they start out as new, they become old. Some of the materials are recycled, recovered. Not the energy. You can't really recycle energy. You can use it more efficiently, but energy is always degraded when you use it to do work. That was what Georgescu Rogan stressed in a quote that I mentioned earlier. And he said, well, if that's the system that we've got, we've, we've got to recognize the limits to how much material and energy we can bring in. And we ought to think, therefore, in terms of a steady state economy which he said we might define in terms of a constant flow of throughput, that's the matter and energy that goes through the economy, at a sustainable low level with population and the capital stock, the machines, the factories, the infrastructure that we build, that's capital, free to adjust to whatever size can be maintained by the constant throughput that begins with depletion and ends with pollution. So if we, as long as we can keep what comes into the economy and what goes out, under control so it can be dealt with by the biological processes that we draw upon then we can have a steady state economy and life can actually be pretty good in terms of policies for this he see he said we need policies on the scale the physical size of the economic system not its financial value but how much material and energy does it does it require relative to the ecosystem that contains and sustains it we need policies for distribution to deal with um, income and wealth so that uh, a certain degree of, of equity prevails, not just let the market determine it and away we go. And then we need a process for allocating or apportioning resources to all the different things we can produce, the different goods and services. He says we need policies for all three. Right now, the most economic policy is focused on this. Uh, there's some policies, depending on which country we talk about, that take distribution seriously with tax and, and transfers. And there are virtually no comprehensive, there's no country which has a comprehensive policy on scale, but has examples for, for where scale is limited, such as on, on trying to control fishing and overuse of fishing, uh, forestry, there's a, a, attempts to control the scale of forestry and so on. But what data is saying, that's got to be comprehensive. I just want to give you one more um, graphic that tells much the same story, but I, I like to use this term called the pre-analytic view of ecological economics. For an economist to get working, they have to have some sort of framework of how they think the whole system hangs together, and then they start theorizing and measuring and so on. Well, in ecological economics, our pre-analytic view, before we begin analysis, uh, starts from, and I've shown a version of it with daily, this is a, a more modern version, where here again is the earth, solar energy coming in, heat loss coming out, planetary sources of materials and fossil fuels and high-grade energy coming in here to the economic subsystem and waste and pollution going out to the planetary sinks. What's really important here is to recognize that this throughput is governed by two very important physical laws. The first says that matter and energy are not created or destroyed. The quantity always stays the same. The second law says that the capacity of energy in particular to do work declines with use. And that's why we keep under this pressure to go back and get more energy by digging up and uh, coal and getting oil and natural gas and so on. Now we're trying to get off that huge problem for economies like ours, which are so dependent on fossil fuels. One more thing from Herman Daly, and I, I've chosen this because I, I, I think it will resonate uh, with, with your, your group. Um, political economy is the old name for economics. Again, I've taken Daly's very first version of this diagram, which he's reproduced, he reproduced in many different ways. The message never changed. He said that what economics, political economy, typically focuses on are the stocks of artifacts and labor power. In other words, the machines we have, and the labor power we have, and he could have added energy as well. And we economics looks at how do we allocate those 
to the different intermediate ends, health, education, comfort, all the things that we consume. But he said that's not sufficient. We need a broader view than that. We need to know how these intermediate means are created. They draw upon the ultimate means, the low entropy energy and matter that the Earth has available for us. So we need to bring physics into economics, and we need to bring techniques, you could call it technology if you prefer, uh, as well, because it's technology that converts the ultimate means into the intermediate means. But he also said something similar about intermediate ends, intermediate towards what end? To an ultimate end, which he said was the subject matter of religion. He put a question mark because he never really ran that one to the ground, if you like, but he had quite a lot to say about. It. He himself was a, uh, to use his own term, a, oh, I've forgotten it. Anyway, he was a Protestant, a, a general purpose Protestant. That was it, because I asked him which Protestant uh, church he belonged to. He said, well, I, he's not too fussy about the differences. Important thing here is that it brings in ethics, the connection between the intermediate means and the ultimate end. So his framework of economics, you can see, is so much broader than one normally encounters. That's Herman, and that's uh, you can learn more about his life and ideas from my book, which was I'm glad to say mentioned in the uh, in the introduction. Getting on a little, I don't know how much time I'm taking, but I know I'm trying to cover a lot of ground in a short order. But I, I'm, I'm getting close towards the end. A well-being economy um, is very interesting because it's been picked up by governments in several countries, and it's been uh, a term that is being more and more used to say we've got to talk about what contributes to well-being rather than what contributes to growth you'll see that this is actually a policy design guide so if you want to know more about their specific policies that they're promoting to um to promote why our, our well-being this is the publication to go to of course it's online and it's free this is an image taken of a, a government uh, members from several governments who have we got here? Scotland, New Zealand, Iceland, Wales, Finland. And they say Canada is actively participating. Personally, as a Canadian, I've not seen any real evidence of that, but they're showing some interest. But uh, these governments have adopted well, well-being as a primary objective of their government policy. So some of them have set up offices, institutions, uh, ministries to test proposals against well-being, not just against economic growth. Another one that's become very popular is Kate Raworth's Donut Economics. She took those um, uh, limits that I mentioned before, uh, those boundaries. Uh, so that's the same list, but she hollowed out the center. So it looks like a donut. And in there, she put the sustainable development goals. And she said, what we should be doing is seeing how these goals can be met within these boundaries. And she coined this term, oh, sorry, the donut economy, and then has promoted this idea so effectively through her book, her writings, she's an, also a terrific speaker, um, to set up um, donut organizations, that's not her term, she talks about them as being labs, uh, in many parts of the world. So here's an example of a group, citizens, they've actually painted the donut, this is Kate's donut, on the floor here, and they're using it to frame their discussion of what they want their community to become like. So that's another one for you to, to check out. Degrowth. What is degrowth? Well, degrowth, defined by one of its leading thinkers, is a planned reduction of energy and resource throughput designed to bring the economy back into balance with the living world in a way that reduces inequality and improves human well-being. And one of the things that appeals to me about degrowth, as I mentioned very briefly before, is it's more than just an academic exercise. It's a set of it's a, it's also an attempt to create a movement whose objective is this. This is a very succinct definition. There's a whole literature on degrowth now, uh, but to bring this as a force of for change, beneficial change in our society. So here's a here's an image of us. Of a, of a march in uh, in France um, calling for degrowth. And of course, it's mostly young people, but it's, it's terrific to see that. But degrowth is also a critique of capitalism and its dependency on growth based on the drive for the accumulation of capital. And it's a social movement centered primarily in continental Europe, but with an increasing presence in other parts of the world, including North America. 
So here am I, my, quite a few years ago, uh, working with my colleague, uh, Tim Jackson. And I want to just say a little bit about our simulation modeling uh, under the heading ecological macroeconomics. So macroeconomics refers to economics of the big system, the economy, but with an ecological dimension now added in. And just to illustrate the pickup of this, this is a conference that was held in earlier this year in the European Parliament. And the speaker, Dan O'Neill, a good ecological economist, uh, is talking about ecological macroeconomics. I, he may not recognize me here, but he, I, I, had no, I, I had no role to play in this, but he decided to feature the model that Tim Jackson and I had, ha, had built, and I'm continuing with some others to, uh, to enhance it. But the fact that this is being discussed and presented in the EU Parliament, I think is very significant. Um, very quickly, well, I don't think I, I'll dwell on, well, I'll just very quickly so put the slide up. The model has several sub-models. One of the real economy, which is about how goods and services are produced, where they're produced, who and who consumes them. And it's calibrated for Canada. It's not, a, it's not just theory, it's based upon real data. It has an electricity sub-model because we believe electricity is going to play such a key role in the transition to some uh, away from fossil fuels. So that's pulled out and analyzed in uh, in more detail. And we have a financial sub-model because finance is so important to the way our economy functions. We also have an environmental sub-model which estimates the material flows and the ecological footprint when we produce our scenarios just so we can see what happens. And those are the two things that I've stressed so much in this presentation. And we also have green, invest green investment. Green investment is investment whose primary objective is to protect the environment, reduce the footprint. Sometimes conventional investment will also do that, but it's pri then its primary objective is usually profit or something to support profit uh, growth. And then we have a variety of metrics to tell us for any scenario how well we're doing. So I'm just going to give you the result of two scenarios for Canada. And I think, by the way, although I can't demonstrate this, we haven't done that yet, the story for the US would be very similar. A continuation of current policies, trends, and relationships, and an escape scenario with many components. An increased price on carbon emissions, you can call that a carbon tax. It can be a cap and trade system. We only model it for electricity generation, but it could be brought more broadly used than that. Rapid electrification of road and rail transportation, some of that we're already seeing. Net zero carbon emissions, we actually do achieve that with the measures we put in place. A significant switch from brown investment to green investment, from investment intended to make profits to investment intended to protect uh, the biosphere. Increased transfer payments, those are payments um, of any kind which uh, increase the income of poorer people, but uh, that comes from a transfer from richer people to reduce income inequality and reduce poverty. Reduced work hours. We can still have technological progress, but we don't always have to use that to produce more stuff. We can work less, as they do in Europe, by the way. A circular economy uh, initiative, set of those initiatives to reduce material flows. That's not on, enough on its own, but as part of a package can be very handy. And then we use a population scenario produced by Statistics Canada, uh, where the population of Canada would stabilize by mid-century. Now, let me just show you some results. Four graphs. Our model produces many graphs. I'm only going to show you four. The first one is of, of material flows. So, so this is the tonnage of all of the materials that flow through the Canadian economy from the current year out 50 years into the future under the two scenarios. The base case, we see materials required by the Canadian economy just increasing steadily over time if we continue on. Under the escape case, you can see what happens. We get a very significant reduction in materials required to run the economy. Well, here's the ecological footprint. It's similar. Under the base case, it continues to rise. Under the escape case, the ecological footprint declines dramatically. Greenhouse gas emissions. With Canada's current plan, we will see a significant drop in greenhouse gas emissions, but we won't get to net zero, even though the government has set it as its target. Under the escape case, because we do quite a lot of other things, 
we do get to net zero by 2045. And for anyone interested in, well, so what about the economic growth of the Canadian economy in this uh, in these two scenarios? Well, the base case, it just continues to rise. The escape case, it's not an impoverishment scenario. Uh, growth slows down until it's not growing at all anymore. Other variables that the model generates, unemployment debt estimates, government debt, household debt, household net worth, that's the wealth of the households, the rate of profit, labor compensation, work time, income distribution, interest rates, and the money supply, and other things. I just want to put that list up there. I'm not going to show you a graph for each one of those. Um, but this kind of modeling, I believe, can be quite useful for scoping out possible futures, plausible futures, and... Um, because if we don't think we've got a choice of the kind of future that we are going to experience, then that's just a formula for despair. Now, I want to tell you these 14 propositions that I came up with, which, if we agree to them, can really help us progress in our discussion about uh, possible futures and preferable futures. Well, I believe, number one, there's, a compelling, e there's compelling evidence that humanity is living in an area of global overshoot. And for each one of these, I've got a graphic, I won't explain it, um, some of you all have seen before. The second, a reduction in the physical scale of the human enterprise is essential to escape from overshoot. We've got to measure our physical impact on the environment and we've got to bring it under control. The historical and current causes and consequences of overshoot are extremely unequal within and among countries. So that's a very important question. That's why people talk about um, a just transition, not just a transition, but a just transition. Um, we have to impose on ourselves limits on material and, and energy throughput and land transformation. They're critical to an escape from overshoot. An ethical principle that I, that I find appealing is known as contraction and convergence. Those countries and those individuals within countries which are using way more than can be supported if everybody was to act like that need to contract and those in poorer circumstances can expand up to a point and then there has, and that's sort of illustrated by the diagram a planned escape from overshoot requires a common sense of purpose we'll have to have communities agreeing there's a certain direction we want to go to which looks very different from the one we've been experiencing in the past and you've seen a common sense of purpose in times of war and in pandemics. I can't read my own text here. Um, an escape from overshoot has to be founded on a principle of justice or on principles of justice. Otherwise, the escape plan will be compromised by people in institutions seeking their own self-interest rather than working towards shared objectives. These principles of justice should be should encompass non-human and human life. I believe a common sense of purpose is more likely to emerge from forms of democracy that combine representation and participation, and which are based on the principle of subsidiarity, which means that social, political, and environmental issues are best dealt with at the most immediate level, consistent with their resolution. So local issues should be dealt with locally not at a state level or, pro or provincial level, as in Canada, or the federal level, to the extent possible. And democracy has to involve much more participation, not just representation. I believe reductions in population should be welcomed, planned for, and encouraged through increased measures such as accessibility to education, especially for girls, increased availability of contraception, provision of a basic income and wealth, and better support for the elderly. Finance should facilitate the escape from overshoot rather than exacerbate it. To this end, money creation by commercial banks, because it's the commercial banks that create most of the money in our economy, not our central, not the Federal Reserve in the US, not the Bank of Canada in Canada. Um, so money creation by commercial banks should be curtailed. The financialization of nature and the implication that it exists solely to serve human interests should be halted and reversed. Technology does not exist in isolation. It is embodied in materials and requires energy for its production and use. 
Technologies often have unintended consequences, which can be positive and negative. Whether and how technology contributes to an escape from overshoot depends on who owns it and what they seek to obtain from that ownership. Number 12, knowledge and ideas should be shared as much as possible, given that they are non-rival. Non-rival means that something which if one person uses it doesn't mean there's any less for anybody else, as opposed to a rival commodity like bread, which if one person eats, well, there's that much less for somebody else. But knowledge and ideas, since they're non-rivals, should be shared because they don't deprive anybody else of their use when one person uses them. Exclusion of potential users through intellectual property rights should be discouraged, especially where it impedes the flow of information, products and services to low income countries, as happened, for example, during the COVID-19 pandemic, where people in poorer countries who couldn't afford to pay for the uh, vaccinations were denied them. Um, I think it says capitalism provides obstacles to an escape from overshoot. I'm sorry, I've got stuff that I'm blocking out some of the text, but I hope it's okay for you. It serves the interests of the owners of capital who through increasingly powerful corporations are constantly looking for ways to extend their reach, increasing overshoot, and only incidentally serving the interests of other members of society. Experience with socialism has a mixed record in relation to overshoot, having focused on growth almost as much as in capitalism, and it has shown the shortcomings of central planning. And finally, overshoot will transform economic and political systems. I think that's true whether we plan to an escape from overshoot or whether we just try to live with the consequences. We're, go we're going to see it change the way we run our economies and our political systems. It's better to choose the transformations we want rather than have them forced upon us by circumstances beyond our control. Finally, I'm going to give you some images of a brighter future. This is just a, um, some that I've selected, which particularly relate to high income countries. Uh, we have to have improved waste management. These are actual photographs of some waste management. Now, of course, that's waste generated in rich countries being uh, sent to poorer countries who don't have the technology to deal with them in a safe manner. But on the right hand side, you can see an example of what's already happening in France to deal with e-waste. Um, we should have better mobility, uh, better urban spaces and cleaner air. This is not a bad view of New York City, but I think we can do better. And there are certainly steps uh, underway to transform the cityscape so that we reduce the impact of, of us on the biosphere. Uh, we definitely need an energy transition um, to something like you see on the left uh, from what you see on the right. Um, I have a particular um, antagonism towards most ads. This is the kind of thing that we're promised. And this is what most of us living in cities in North America experience. This is, a, I believe this is taken in Toronto. Um, but I think if they show this in the ads and this is, you, you too can join in, in this, uh, it, it would obviously affect sales. Um, I think intergenerational living, which is beginning to catch on is really important because we are an aging population. And that with that comes um, the concern about uh, so, uh, loneliness and greater health risks. Um, malnutrition and um, financial strain. So here's a an image taken of um, a three generation family living in the same house, uh, but housing has to be, in many cases, designed to make this kind of living uh, more attractive. Uh, plenty of opportunity to change diet. This is not healthy for people or the planet. <clears throat> the Lancet, a very important medical journal in in Britain, a few years ago. Uh, took a look at a, what they called a one planet diet. Uh, they had more images than this, but this is some of the meals that can be cooked from food that can be sustainably grown. And uh, there's enough capacity on planet Earth to provide these kinds of meals for everybody. We need less of this and more of this because this isn't just growing food. It's also community, um, which is very important. Uh, more sharing. This was taken out of public library in Edmonton. In, uh, in Canada, and uh, you can see all the great technology that's there. We don't have to all try to buy this stuff for ourselves. Uh, we can share it, and what better place than a public library? 
And I am going to end with this slide. Oh, well, there's one more just to say thank you, but this is a slide which is so important. There is no planet B. This is what this is our home. If we don't take care of this, it'll be game over. And um, the youngsters, many youngsters now understand this and are pushing us, those older folks such as myself, to continue to work uh, in this direction and uh, committing themselves to do so as well. So with that, I will thank you for your attention. I know it's been a lot of material, but I hope that I've stimulated some thoughts and uh, and questions that you want to ask. Excellent. Thank you very much, Peter. Um, uh, we do have some time left for, for a few questions. And <laughs> uh, again, a reminder, if you would like to ask a question, go down to your uh, reactions button on the Zoom toolbar, click on the words raise hand, and that'll take you to the front of the screen. Um, uh, where we can um, uh, recognize you in sequence. Uh, Suzanne, yes. Well, I feel like a bit of a broken record here, but <clears throat> this is the place to have that one. Um, you hadn't mentioned uh, when you're talking about a common sense of purpose, uh, how that could come from our creation story that needs to change. Um, and do, you, do I need to say more to ask you about that? Uh, well, that's what I, I'm, I'm really glad you raised that. Um, a common sense of purpose can come from multiple sources. Uh, the, the sense of purpose is the direction that we want to go in, the priorities that we have. I don't think everybody has to have a shared view of everything else in order to agree on the direction that we want to go in. So if um, I see no reason why a creation story and this, uh, let me just say again, that Herman Daly, who has been so important in the generation of this way of thinking about the economy and the ideas we should go in, would just put his hand up and say, yes, I agree. Absolutely. Let's get on to the next question. Just one uh, hand up. He could put one hand up. Yes, he did that. Um, you know, he didn't have another hand. No, that's true. Good, you know that. Uh, well, he would have uh, metaphorically put up two hands, but uh, you're right. Um, I don't. I don't have that view. I don't. I don't draw on my. I don't draw on it for my inspiration. I. Uh, but. I, but as I say, a common purpose. People of different perspectives can agree on priorities and and where we need to go. And I. I've read a little bit about your your group, your organization, uh, and uh, see no conflict at all. But if you accept that we're in overshoot and that we have to change the direction of our economy and our society and the way we live, uh, we can work together uh, on that. The, the fact that we get our inspiration from different sources, to me, is less of a problem. I hope that's true, because otherwise it's going to be very, very difficult. Well, this is a whole other conversation, you know, as we think, so we act. And if we feel like we're sainted creatures, we take care of the earth. And if we're competitive creatures, um, you know, we uh, we don't um, just for a basic essence. Yeah. And to me, you know, if, if you're looking for the single thing that can change everything the most, it's to deal with changing our story of who we think we are. What are we all doing here? Um, so but that's a whole no, no, no. Well, uh, yeah, I think that's true. But I read a book recently. You may have seen it called Humankind. Are you, are you familiar with that book, Humankind? Oh, it's a, it, it's a terrific book. But he's basically, he uses that term because he wants to show that humans are fundamentally a kind species. And and the, the idea that we're, you know, uh, just we're fundamentally competitive. And that's why capitalism is the right way to go, because that's how, who we are. It is completely wrong. And he, he, he uh, but he doesn't draw upon uh, a different creation story. It's more of a different account of what humans are like, however we were created. So uh, I do think there's room for different stories that can lead to um, where I think we need to go. But all right, let's move on, shall we? <laughs> there well, is I, more, I do more. think perhaps that there is another layer for you to put into your whole system here because it's the story that science now supports of being in an expanding universe where we're one humanity. And if we feel ourselves that way, we take care of everything together. Um, yeah. But it, but it comes from our story. It's, you know, we, we're very much influenced by who we think we are. Yes. But again, I, it's a very big topic, you know. Yeah. No, I, but I think you and I agree at that general level. I think what I'm trying to say is, we don't have to agree on who we think we are. 
to agree on where we think we should go. Well, it's where we came from as one humanity, being in an evolutionary process and not just here on the earth to use it and make yeah. rules. Um, yeah. Well, that, that, that to that extent, it's captured in the humankind story because he traces the success of humans in part to the fact, part, and partly the fact that we were a kind species that helped each other and that by working together in community, we were able to solve problems that otherwise we would not have solved. But so, it's our I mean, story that makes yeah. us that kind people. You know, where does that come yeah. from? Oh, sorry, Suzanne. Okay. <laughs> My finger slipped there. Thank, thank yeah, you very yeah. much for that question. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, Winnie, yes. Hi, Peter. Thank you for that. Um, that's just loaded with info. Um, <laughs> my question is, do you have a sense of what is being taught in business schools? Um, I did my MBA 15 years ago in international economic development, but it was a strange program because it really was very much focused on social justice and sort of grassroots kinds of things. And they did look at this stuff, but not as much as what you're talking about. But um, just a couple years ago, I happened to talk with someone who had just got her master's degree in international development. And she said that she was reading Donut Economics, as was I at the time. And I was thrilled to hear that she was that the program was, you know, that was in our program. But do you have a sense of what is being taught in business in like, uh, you know, economics programs, especially at the graduate level? Well, I think my experience is very similar to yours. Um, at my university, the largest faculty is the business school. Uh, one in, well, this data may be out. When I was, I was a dean myself, um, when I was dean, the business school, was responsible for one in five business students MBAs in Canada, and one in three in Ontario. It was very big, um, and they had a very and they have an even stronger sustainability stream in the business school. Um, uh, they don't go as far as as I would go, uh, but but the interesting thing from the observation I would make, I think they're less constrained by their intellectual history to investigate these ideas and take them seriously than traditional economics departments are, which have become highly mathematized, uh, uh, happy to make the most unrealistic assumptions. For example, it was it's very common to say, well, we'll assume away the environment. They don't say that. They say, we'll assume away externalities. Well, that's absurd, but that's what they'll do and not think anything of it. And so what happens is students who don't can't live with that kind of assumption leave the, the, the training and that, so who stays in economics people who are content with that sort of simplification well I, I found my experience limited as it is with business schools they're not they're not subject to those kinds of constraints they're more open in a way to what's changing in the world are there new ways of thinking I'm not that surprised I'm glad to hear it but I'm not that surprised they're reading donut economics um it doesn't actually challenge business schools in the way it might challenge a conventional economics department so um it, the real problem for me though because i've been doing this stuff for so long is the pace of change is so slow um the, the students who are maybe now getting exposed to these kinds of ideas maybe not as in the, quite the way i would do it but still uh, getting the flavor of the ideas um it'll be some time before they're in positions of real influence and, uh, and significance in in business that they go into that, that yeah we don't have that much we don't have we don't have we should have had more time because this some of these things have been around for at least half a century um uh, so yes it has it, the business schools are, are showing some promise but it's, <laughs> it's not enough i don't know so i oh i just want to say one other thing um I'm going to a community college. I don't know if you use that term in the States, but it's, it's, it's also higher education in a couple of weeks. They want um, sustainability to be a requirement in every program they teach in the college, whether that's business, engineering, economics, a requirement. I'm sorry, I've asked me to come down to some others to, to give a sort of day-long workshop on what that might look like. So that's a, that's another indication. And, that, and they are part of a... Um, nationwide um, effort to see that that happens in other colleges. So good. some good things are happening. That's great. Thank you. Good news. Thank you. Uh, Robert, yes, go ahead. Uh, unmute yourself, please, Robert. 
thought you were going to do that since you did it the other time. All right. So, um, uh, uh, a couple, a couple of things, um, but only one comes to mind right now, and that is, what was your, what were you, why were you drawn, uh, to Herman Daly and his ideas, and you wrote a biography. And and you ref, you you refer to his uh, very religiousness, <laughs> and I just put, I wonder if if there's if you see a link there to his economic thought, um, and and what he was suggesting, and I my my, my only other comment is um, I'm a revolutionary, and I believe we need a revolution, so that would be the the answer to why it takes so it takes. It's such a slow process. Thanks. Okay, I, I encountered Herman Daly as a grad student. I, I So I, I came up with this approach to take um, the way economies are are conventionally modeled, um, but in a, a macro model, so it's the whole economy, but it's detailed. It tells you industry by industry. And I thought, well, if we know what each, if we if we can use this model to tell us what each industry is producing, we could attach to that a sort of water per dollar of output by each industry, for example, or energy per dollar of output. And so every time we run the model and we get a different mix of output by these industries, we could say how much water, how much of these materials would be required. So I was, I was, it was a, a, I don't want to go into technical detail, but it was a way of empirically estimating um, if a consumer spent $100 on clothing, what would that mean all the way back through the system in terms of the materials required, the energy used, and the waste ultimately produced. And that's become a fairly widely used methodology. Now, there wasn't much literature on it when I back in the 60s but one article I found was by Herman Daly where he had had a very similar idea it was but it was not the main thrust of his article he hadn't worked out the math and hadn't implemented it so that's when I first encountered him and then I started seeing other articles by him his his book on the steady state economy came out in 1973 and so I was intrigued by it and then I met him at a conference or something and I really he's a really likable man and um uh about five six seven years ago i i started thinking someone should write his biography and i started asking around approaching people who i thought were capable to do it and my wife kept saying to me well you should write it you should write it. and finally I, I couldn't find anybody and i'd come to the end of one project and i i said well i'll have a go let me get in touch with them and i contacted him and he agreed to let me because i had to interview him course to write the biography properly sure, sure. um uh he said but he wanted the focus to be on his life and ideas not on his and oh, sorry on his ideas not on his life he thought his life was uninteresting that's far from true so there's the book is very much about his ideas um uh the so that that meant i had to take the whole man yeah it wasn't up to me I wasn't out to debate with him in the book. I wanted to be, I wanted to convey his ideas as well as I could to the reader. Uh, there's a lot of criticism of, idea, of his ideas in the book, but mostly that's other e economists criticizing him. So I would, I would describe the debate. Um, and I, I ended up, now I talk about Daly's great debates he had many he was a terrific guy he just uh he would talk with anybody he said, i just want to put my ideas out there we'll discuss them life not like that his ideas became really unpopular among economists he felt so uncomfortable he was a full professor that he had to leave academia and he went to work for the world bank mm. and after several successful years there he tried to get back into academia and he couldn't get a tenured position anywhere in the u.s I don't know. That, also, he, but he won all sorts of international prizes and he had a research position in a university. It was the economics department has said it would be very embarrassing if he was given tenure. So he wasn't given tenure. Finally, he's getting these prizes and the president of the university calls him into his office and says, uh, Professor Daly, it's very embarrassing that you don't have tenure. 
So we're going to give it to you right now. <laughs> oh. Anyway. Um, wow. Well, thank you for thank you for that. And, and no, I mean that's that's just that. sort of very potted history of, of daily. I I'm not a religious person, and certainly not in the way he was, but I acknowledge that I was fundamental to him, and one of the influences on him. It made it made ethical questions really important to him. He didn't want to separate sort of an analyst a, analysis from ethics, and I found that really interesting because I'm also interested in ethics. I just don't think yeah. I derive them from a particular religion, but not that they're not inspired in some way and connected in some well, way to that. Ethics in some ways is implicit to economics. I mean, it, that, but he but he wasn't a revolutionary. No, of course not. Right. <laughs> he, he thought that the changes could be made through more sensible policies. Well, he was, but I would say he was increase. He was leaning in that direction increasingly because he'd been around so long and change hadn't been made in the way he wanted. Um, now, um, but it would be wrong for me to represent him as a as a as a revolutionary, except in, in terms of his ideas. They're revolutionary. Well, that, that's just that's just me. But I'm always I I I find people with revolutionary ideas compelling. So uh, I, I will pursue. I'm sure your book is available, and I look forward to oh, yeah. hunting for it. All right. thank, thank you, Peter. Really Please. Really. Please, please move on to the next. Uh, Thanks, Robert. Um, we are at the end of our scheduled time, but I'm going to squeeze in one more question here because we've got so much interest going on. Uh, so, Paul, uh, please, succinctly, please. Yeah, thank you. And uh, thank you, Peter, for a very informative presentation. I learned a lot today. I've been following uh, COP28 this week, and I hear the term climate finance which is not the same as economics, but I was curious as to whether you had any perspectives on what this term climate finance really means. Well, to the um, best of my knowledge, what they've mostly talked about is uh, setting up a fund um, to do two main things. One is compensate um, the poorer countries that have suffered uh, disproportionately from climate change, and also to give them more help in not following our path in terms of their development. Uh, this is all very promising. It's been talked about before, but from the media coverages I've seen, uh, the, the other countries are now putting real money behind it. But, you know, we'll have to see, well, these are pledges, whether the money actually comes forward, how it's going to be spent, who gets to decide. Um, um, I have had some experience in uh, in international aid. I was a renewable energy advisor for two and a half years in, in East Africa, uh, paid for by the Canadian government. And I, and I, a lot of aid is tied. In other words, we'll give you the money, but you've got to spend it in our country and we'd like you to buy these things. Uh, you know, it's, it's, if that's, if that's the sort of thing they come up with, it's, it won't be, it won't be good enough. Uh, I think you've got to use local knowledge much more. Um, you can give guidance, but uh, so it's so it really, as they say, devils in the details, uh, and we'll see. Uh, but it, but but that's just amelioration of damage that's been done and compensation for that, and and helping them shift to a, a different path as we move into the future. But what about what about the U.S.? What about Canada? What are we going to do that's different? Um, we, one of our one of our provinces is now saying uh, they're, they're really pushing back on uh, saying that it's really not a federal problem that they, they have no right no constitutional right to tell us what to do in relation to climate change and of course what they want to do is less than the federal government which has already made all sorts of compromises wants to, wants to do so uh, i believe that they need a much stronger push from the public from the voters uh, to change those positions. And they're not getting that at the moment. Yeah, thank you. A lot more up to us than governments, I think. Yeah, yeah. thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. I'm very sorry to have to cut us off there. Uh, I know we could go on for, for a, a much longer period of time. Um, but Peter, I wanted to thank you very much for taking the time to be with us today.
and uh, to share with us your insights and um, uh, in a way that is is much more accessible to the layperson, I think, than than many of us who've been exposed to uh, economics texts in the past. So uh, it's been very helpful and very insightful. Um, and um, Penny, did well, you? Can, have... I, can I just say, Bob? I, I, thank you, everybody, for inviting me to speak to you. Um, I, I want to say this in the best way, possible way I can. I really like to speak to groups that don't see things the way I do, and I don't. Uh, I, I, mean, I think the search for common ground is really important, and we can only find the common ground if we talk to one another. Um, so I hope that some some of what I said uh, can can be useful to you, working with the, within the frame that that you that you operate. So that's why I'm I'm very appreciative of the opportunity. Absolutely, thank you. Yes, I, I, I remind myself of that weekly, daily, to listen to those that don't think exactly like I do. So, uh, and I certainly got some good material out of your presentation. So, um, uh, I believe Penny, we may have a couple of closing words uh, as to send us off into the to to the rest of our evening. Excellent. Yeah, thank you, Peter. Uh, much to think on. So we close with Rainier Maria Rilke. Have patience with everything unresolved in your heart and try to love the questions themselves as if they were locked rooms or books written in a very foreign language. Don't search for the answers which could not be given to you now because you would not be able to live them. And the point is to live everything. Live the questions now. Mm. Beautiful. Thank you ever so much. Thank all of you for being here today and for your attention and your questions. And uh, we look forward to seeing you in January. Remember, it's on January 11th, the second Thursday of the month. And we look forward to seeing you then. Thanks. Thank you all for coming.